Good evening. On Thursday evening, I was at a dinner program with some lawyers, and the question came up, are HBCUs still relevant, and are they needed? I vocally stated that HBCUs are needed. They're needed now more than ever before. I read an article in the Washington Post recently that stated that law is the least diverse profession in this nation. The article further stated that we lawyers are not doing enough to diversify our profession. I want to personally thank Ms. Mitchell for what she's doing with this pre-law event. Ms. Ms. Mitchell, you're answering the call to what that article stated that we should be doing. Amen. And I'm also thankful for HBCUs because I have my law degree because of HBCBU, HBCUs. My personal roadmap to law school is non-traditional. I'm a very transparent person. When I was in third grade, my father and mother divorced. When they divorced, my father did not provide our family much support. My mother worked sometimes two and three jobs. We lived in Section 8 public housing. And young people, we were on welfare and we received food stamps. But there were some constants in my life. My mother made sure that me and my siblings, we had three meals per day. Another constant in my life was I excelled in sports. And then the final constant in my life was that I graduated with honors from high school. I, I, was, I did very well academically. I graduated within the top 10% of my class. When I graduated from high school, the only college that I could afford to attend was a small HBCU that was located about 10 miles from my hometown called Fort Valley State College. Right. Attending that small HBCU was a life-changing decision for me. When I enrolled at Fort Valley State College, I was all academics. However, there were some professors there that took me under their wings and they molded me and they shaped me and they pushed me to become a leader. At the end of my sophomore year, one of my professors talked with me. He asked me, what was I thinking about doing? What were my future plans when I graduated from college? My initial plans, young people, were, was to counsel juvenile delinquents. I wanted to work with troubled, at-risk youth. That professor at Fort Valley State College told me that I was one of the better students at that college and that I should consider law school. Young people, that professor lit that fire in me. If it had not been that, for that professor, if it had not been for Fort Valley State College, I would not have a law degree. When that professor lit that fire in me, my advisor, she also began to push and mold me and shape me and guide me toward law school. That professor who initially lit that fire in me is Judge Greg Homer. My advisor who continued to push and nudged me toward law school, that was the late Laverne Ford. And that's what our HBCUs do, young people. They take people like Ira Foster, who grew up poor, who grew up, who did not have folks in his family to talk with him about the college process. He did not have folks in his family to talk with him about the law school process, but thank goodness for that small HBCU that was about 10 miles from my hometown, students. Thank God for those professors that at Fort Valley State that saw something in me that I did not even see in myself, young people. They saw that if they pushed me, if they nudged me, if they encouraged me, that I could go on and be a lawyer. And so when I graduated from Fort Valley State University, I applied to law schools. But once again, uh, my LSAT scores were not high enough for me to be admitted in many law schools. I received several letters stating that, I, stating that I was being placed on the waiting list. But thank goodness there was another HBCU that saw something in me and gave me a chance, and that was North Carolina Central University. North Carolina Central admitted me into their law school, and North Carolina Central gave me a chance, young people. North Carolina Central gave me a chance, and I took the most of it, and I graduated from law school, and I started to work with Georgia Legal Services Program, and I have been uh, with Georgia Legal Services Program for the past 
30 years. Young people, I started off as a staff attorney with Georgia Legal Services Program, but I didn't stop there, young people. I moved up to become a supervising attorney with Georgia Legal Services Program, young people, but I did not st stop there, young people. I became a managing attorney with Georgia Legal Services Program, young people, but I did not stop there, young people. I became the first, young people, I became the first black director for Georgia Legal Services Program, young people, seven months ago. So young people, what I want to say to you is this. With me, the Lord had a plan for my life. Sometimes God has a plan for our lives and we don't even realize it. I now realize that the Lord had a plan for me and that plan for, was for me to do public service law and I'm so thankful that I am doing God's plan. And as I conclude, I wanna leave a few short stories with you young people. I, I wanna share with you uh, my first major case that I did with Georgia Legal Services six, six months out of law, law school. I represented a lady in a social security case. Uh, she was an elder lady, she had poor health. Uh, I received a a lump sum payment of about $30,000 with her, young people. When I asked her, I said, man, what are you gonna do with all that money you receive? What are you gonna do with that $30,000 lump sum payment? She told me, she said, the first thing that I'm gonna do is buy me some tephasis. <laughs> now, 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 we all know that she meant that she was going to get some dental work done and get some, dent some dentures, but that made me realize that sometimes we take the simple things in life for granted. Another, ca another uh, case, a situation I want to leave with you is that um, when I first started practicing law, I did a lot of community service. I, I went to schools and I volunteered and I taught with students. And I can remember on one occasion early in my law practice, I went to the recreation part department to play basketball. The basketball gymnasium and the recreation department was located near the public housing projects. When I arrived, there were some little boys outside playing. One little boy ran up to me and he said, and I'll never forget this young people, he said, Mr. Foster, you don't have to lock your car. His friends came up with him and they said, yeah, Mr. Foster, you don't have to lock your car. One of the little boys said, Mr. Foster, you help my auntie keep her apartment. He said, we got you, Mr. Foster, you don't have to lock your car. And guess what, an hour later when I returned outside, they were still there watching my car and they came up to me and said, Mr. Foster, when are you gonna come back and, and play ball again? We're gonna, we got you covered. Just, that just made me realize that we are role models. Young people, when you graduate from law school, you're gonna be role models. So just remember that people are gonna be watching you. And then one other, another situation I wanna leave with you is about five years ago, I was speaking at a back to school event. At the event was over, a young man came up to me and told me, he said, Mr. Foster, you don't remember me, do you? I said, no. He said, Mr. Foster, you helped me get back in school when I was in the 11th grade, when I was suspended. He said, Mr. Foster, if you had not helped me get back in school, I probably would have dropped out of school. He said, now I'm in college. I'm a junior in college, and I'm going to be a basketball coach and a teacher. He said, you helped me fulfill my dream of going to school and becoming a teacher, and if you had not helped me get back in school, I probably would have dropped out of school. And one final, um, Situation that I want to leave with you is this. About six years ago, I helped start a school dropout prevention program with Georgia Legal Services Program. Young people, statistics say that about 70% of our black males that drop out of school, they will end up going to jail or prison. I started a school dropout prevention program to help alleviate that issue. About five years ago, we did the school dropout to prison prevention workshop in Valsalto, Georgia. After the program was over, a single parent mother came up to me. She said, Mr. Foster, thank you for doing this workshop. She said, I have four sons, Mr. Foster, but young people get this, get this. She said, three of my sons are in prison. Three of my sons are in prison. She said, this workshop made me realize that my three sons that are in prison, they're in prison because they dropped out of school. She said, Mr. Foster, I have one son left. She said, my baby boy is in the 10th grade. This workshop made me realize I've got to fight with all my power to keep my baby boy in jail because if I don't, these streets going to get him and he's going to end up in prison just like his brothers and sisters. And so she, I mean, his brothers, I'm sorry. So she said, thank you for doing this workshop because this, this workshop put things in perspective for me. This, that lady came to that workshop. She was seeking hope 
that workshop gave her hope. She came to that workshop seeking help. That workshop gave her help. And young people, that's what I have been doing with my law degree for the last 30 years. I have been there for those that have came seeking help. I have been there for those that did not have hope. That's what being a lawyer means. A lawyer, being a lawyer means that everyone in this country should be entitled to quality representation, regardless of whether their income, regardless of their circumstances. That's what justice is. And when you, young people, when you obtain your law degree, make sure that justice prevails in this country. And finally, in conclusion, Ms. Mitchell, I want to thank you again. I'm honored and I'm humbled to receive this award and to the additional honorees. Thank you also for what you all are doing to make a difference in this country. Thank you.